So a question came up. Th does anybody knew, know who that cartoon character is? That's the Duke. Duke, that's correct. <laughs> yeah, Duke was the compromise. When they were open sourcing Java, they had to decide on what license to use. Uh, all the people I knew wanted BSD license, uh, but Sun went with GPL. But they BSD licensed Duke. That was the compromise. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that's perhaps the only the only character, or uh, what do you call it, uh, mascot who's un released under the BSD license. So we've got some news. Some things happened. Uh, we've had it's been in the news for the last I don't know three or four meetings that there is question marks all around Java EE8 whether Oracle <laughs> has lost interest in Java Enterprise Edition or whatever because uh, the the main thing that got people wondering is that they pulled all of their full-time employees off of the Java EE8 spec lead duties t to do other things that people could only guess at what they were doing. So, Apparently and the project they were working on fell through or didn't come out. They were working on a compatible product and it hasn't worked out and that's why they're suddenly... Yeah, but my theory is that... My theory is that they were working on the Java 9 SE release, which is delayed and behind schedule, and that they probably thought that was more important. But whatever it was, the Tom Thomas Curian, who's the president of product at Oracle, did a big Info InfoWorld interview a couple weeks ago. And uh, he said, no, we're still doing Java EEA. We're going to increase the scope. I guess since it's already behind schedule, that's what you do with software projects. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know nothing about this. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, oh, it's late. Let's just do more. So, um, yeah, they're going to sort of get, have bigger ambitions around HTTP2 for standardized APIs for asynchronous communication between the client and the server. Um, multi tenant, that's been a thing that got added and dropped from the last two Java EE releases. So they're going to take another run at it. We'll see. It's kind of like modules, but that's actually coming now in Java 9. I remember seeing the, the there was a jigsaw demo uh, that was destined for, was it Java 6? 6, yeah. So it's coming in 9 now. Uh, so maybe multi-tenancy just needed a few Java EE releases to incubate or something. Yeah, it's on schedule. Um, so they want to add direct support for microservices in their APIs. I don't even know what it means for Java EE to support Docker. That <laughs> doesn't actually make sense to me. Maybe you'll have a thing that's like bigger than an ear. It'll be like a, a dir. <laughs> yes? I'm convinced people will realize that to, to the hyper containerization will become just the processes as a separation of services. Yeah, it'll, it'll be full cycle, yeah. yeah. It'll be like, hey, there's like this process security model that we had in the 70s, it was cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know, they could call it a derp. It could be a <laughs> Docker, Docker Enterprise Archive Package. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, we'll find out what that is when it comes out. Uh, capabilities to take advantage of NoSQL, no that's probably because you know, JPA kind of is a s slight modification and standardization of what Hibernate does. And so Hibernate has the NoSQL variant <coughs> that's been going for a couple of years. So they'll probably suck that into JPA. Um, support, for, support for emerging authentication and authorization models. We'll probably see last month's presentation, which um, we don't have the recording online, but that. I assume they're re referring to OAuth and JWT and that kind of thing. So Java 1 is coming. You can learn what's happening with Java EE8, probably at the keynote there. Um, it's coming soon, September 18th to 22nd. Speaker acceptance started going out recently. 
and Billy Joel will be singing at the appreciation event. So, yeah. <laughs> if that's all you care about, you can, you can buy like an $1,800 US ticket to go see Billy Joel, and there'll be some Java as well. I think there's Jug Bumper pricing. It's like you get 20% off or something. So oh, cool. That's good. It's I've been I've been to like five or six Java ones. It's a very worthwhile conference. Doubly so if you can get your employer to pay. But even if you're spending your own money, I, I think it's worth going. Or if there's a bit of talking like person. Yes. Yeah. So. Hi, highly recommended. Every everybody should go at least once. So DevOps is also coming. It's in November. It's a little bit cheaper. It's a little bit further away, but not much. So it's in Android. Yeah. It's much more fun than San Francisco. It is more fun than San Francisco, <laughs> but when you go to San Francisco, like all the billboards are targeted at software developers, which is a weird thing to experience. <laughs> in, in, really in Antwerp, it's just normal people. But their headliner should clearly be Neil Diamond. Yes. Neil Diamond will sing at DevOx. We'll, we'll hold them to that. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, that's a really cool conference. Uh, Dan and I are going to go this year. Uh, Christoph, who normally he's a regular here, but he's going he's going to Spring One next week, so he's decided not to like stay up really late and get drunk tonight. So. We want t-shirts. T-shirts. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we'll bring t-shirts, and there's always a poster as well with lots of inside jokes on it. <coughs> right, so new releases. We've got a pair of Java SE updates. They come in pairs now. Which is like, uh, what is that? The Sith Lords, don't they come in pairs? <laughs> There's always two of them. Or Firefly ends in blue 2x2. Yes. So uh, we have updates 101 and 102 for Java 8. So as always, there's a time zone database update that happens you know, pretty much every time. If you want to know why, see Jack's talk from two months ago, which we do have a video of. Um, pretty interesting, uh, all the details around time zones. Uh, they had a, Corba is still a thing, I guess. They were adding features to Corba and they spelled a property name wrong. So they had, <laughs> They had enable custom value handler, which is like a security property, very important. And they spelled it wrong in the previous release. So for this release only, they'll support both the typo and the correct spelling. And then starting in October, you'll need to spell it right again. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then there were a couple of minor security updates that I couldn't fit on the slide, and then every Java SE release has an expiry date where it adds even more warning dialogues if you try to run applets, which you shouldn't. But if you do, you get like three warning dialogues instead of two after October 19th. So then update 102 comes out. Oh, does anybody remember what these are called, by the way? There's the updates come in pairs. Yes. Update 101 is a CPU, and update 102 is a PSU. So they're both reused acronyms from things you find inside of a PC. It's interesting. Um, so the CPU is a critical patch update, and the PSU is the product support update, something like that. This one has everything from 101 plus a few more things that will be in the next CPU. <laughs> Can't, I, I don't even. Um, so they took out a few packages for like private packages that you were never allowed to use. Um, Sun invoke anon. But of course, did somebody did anyway. So that's their fault, and it's your fault if you use their library. Um, apparently, there's a work-alike method in the Sun misc unsafe, which they still haven't deprecated. So not all is lost yet. Oh, right. So if you're using large thread local stuff, I don't even know how you turn that on. But if, if you want like a large amount of thread local data in your VM, apparently it would crash the VM 
if you asked for too much and then you created a bunch of threads. So they created a hotspot argument to make that size bigger so it doesn't steal all your thread stack. Uh, they also added some hotspot options for doing big integer multiplies and squares that helps with making crypto faster using some uh, CPU optimizations and a bunch more stuff that didn't fit. And that expires on the same day as 101. So you can choose which one you want. Ooh, that's bright. So that's a screenshot of the Drop Wizard 1.0 site. This is probably, I would say, like a Spring Boot competitor. It's a framework that you embed a web server and a bunch of software that you need, and you make microservices in it, and you just get executable jars that have a web server and all the stuff in it, and you run them. So you get a self-contained web application in one jar. So Drop Wizard is very opinionated, as is Spring Boot. It has some slightly different opinions, like it uses JaxRS as opposed to Spring MVC. It uses Jetty. It uses Jetty as opposed to Tomcat by default. Yep. Um, so they just made a bunch of choices for you. They think that they're the right ones. And it really simplifies creating a small standalone REST service. So they went 1.0. I guess this, they're stable now. So probably a good time to check it out. Probably a really good time for someone to volunteer to do a talk on this at a future JUG meeting. I can make a warrant write like six of them. In that time. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> OK, you got to stop coming to these, eh? <laughs> <laughs> these are for me and Dan. Oh, OK, so Jeff uh, in November is going to give us the full rundown. Yes, there we go. <laughs> See, here I have the power. Don't fire me. <laughs> hey, Owen, want a job? <laughs> oh, the plot thickens. So anyway, if anyone is interested in Drop Wizard, do tell us, because a uh, talk on this would be really good. Uh, Spring 5.0 Milestone 1 got released today. So the highlights there are they dropped support for everything before Java 8, which I think is good. Java 8's been out for a while, and you shouldn't probably support stuff that comes before it. I think that's 7. Java 8 is 2-ish. Yeah, on Android, it's, it's less than 1, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, they also upped the baseline for all the EE7 APIs, like servlet, JMS, JPA, and that kind of stuff. So you need a minimum Java EE7, which, as we discussed previously, is the newest Java EE, because 8 is kind of stalled. 2014? Wow. They're taking their sweet time on 9, aren't they? Yeah, it's a toddler. Uh, they also drop support for a bunch of old stuff that you probably don't want to use anymore, like Portlet. Who's using Portlet? <laughs> no? OK, you can tell me later. If it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Velocity templates, Jasper reports, XML beans, I don't even know what that is, JDO, and Guava? I don't know what they s mean by drop support for Guava. That's what this, oh, that's your question. It's like, Maybe it used to come with Guava. But is it like an anti, <laughs> is Spring 5 an anti-Guava? Like if you put Guava in your class path, it's just like, no. I don't know. Uh, yeah, so it's to your, to your, you don't know what XML beans are. They're a truly horrific way of dealing with XML in Jeff. Hmm. So dropping support for them is OK? I, I would think so. <laughs> All right. So it's reasonable that they drop support. Yep. Portlet is a similar story, I think. Yeah, I, or maybe they accepted Guava collection types in their API and they took that out. Anyway, I don't know what that means. Uh, and they, they had a bunch of deprecated stuff from Spring 4, and they've actually taken it away now. Yeah, they actually removed it. <laughs> There's still a big debate in Java SE whether they should do that or not. Instead of actually removing stuff in Java SE 9, 
the strategy is to introduce a new type of deprecation, which is like really deprecated. <laughs> Like it's still here because, well, you know, if you train people for 20 years that their bytecode will run forever on the new Java, if you take away the old APIs, they're going to become like Rails developers and they hate themselves. So <laughs> to make the world a better place, the Java core team suffers with old APIs and they just tell you not to use them. But they still stay there. Well, you don't have to use them. So the, the really deprecated stuff in Java 9 will be, like, you really shouldn't use this. <laughs> Whereas the somewhat deprecated stuff will be, there is a better thing, but whatever you want. Oh, yeah. The really, really deprecated is look for another <laughs> the, uh, the proposal for that uh, really deprecated one was denigrated. <laughs> I don't know if that's what they went with, but they had deprecated and denigrated. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, more stuff from Spring 5. Uh, they're adding in a reactive programming framework that's kind of been off to the side as a sub-project. They're going to put it in core. So you'll be able to have reactive programming model for web servers and web clients, which is interesting, because often you need to do a bunch of HTTP requests in parallel to satisfy one incoming request. So that's cool. They're adding JUnit, so JUnit 5 support in their testing framework. Also, the topic of an upcoming talk from an unknown speaker. And Protobuf 3, which I don't know anything about, but I guess it's still beta, so that's cutting edge. So who's here for the beer and who's here for me by show of hands? <laughs> beer? Good. Me? Woo! <laughs> Oh, so appreciated. I don't feel. For you if you'll buy the I, <laughs> I see how this goes. <laughs> hey, we're not pivotal. That's good. <laughs> I feel less pressure that way. Uh, okay. Uh, this screen's black, which is terrific. So, um, so yeah. So I'm Jeff. I uh, I describe myself now as a computer programming enthusiast because my uh, education was never formally in computer programming and I do way less programming than I used to. Um, running the team at Pattison and everything else. Um, now it's mostly program things that are extremely urgent at work and play around with open hab at home. So welcome to the show. Um, OpenHab, if you haven't heard of it, or if you haven't heard of home automation, um, I suppose you might have been under a rock, but um, everyone wants their home to do favors for them because this is the century of laziness. Um, and why not? Uh, there's been a lot of uh, stuff throughout the years. I don't know how many people might have played around with X10 back in the 80s, 70s. Um, Nice, Angelo, good one at least. Um, and it's, it's, it's certainly come a long way. Um, X10 was kind of this weird power line protocol that happened and then we got into more modern things that still went over power line and that's where Insteon will come into this and you'll see that. Um, but OpenHab is really intended, I think mostly as just kind of a giant bottle of Elmer's glue to take anything and everything that you have in your house that has an API or has some means of accessing it um, and get them to all talk to each other. So uh, it is based on OSGI as we were, we were discussing earlier. No one really knows what that stands for. <laughs> and um, hmm? what? Something like that. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's interesting because I, I don't think that it necessarily fits the product. It just happens to have been based on that. That was never really intended to do this exact thing. Um, nonetheless, OpenHab uses um, modules and, um, well, as I say here, all the things, all of your stuff, um, everything that you can use to then control the things. So they do have um, a control interface. Uh, no worries. Uh, it's in you know a normal web browser. All of the mobile platforms are covered, and I 
uh, discovered yesterday that they have an app for Pebble. So if anyone has a Pebble, you're all set. Um, it is intended to be very lightweight. Anything that can run a JVM can run this. So you've got your Raspberry Pi, your BeagleBone Black, your whatever, whatever the flavor of the day is. Uh, OpenHab can certainly do that for you. So the Pork Hive. Oh, the Pork Hive is uh, my moniker for my home. It is based on the fact that in high school people called me Pork. You don't need to worry about the backstory. Just trust me on this. Um, <clears throat> so what we see here is we've got um, Insteon, and I'm really at this point telling you about my implementation because there are uh, a gazillion connectors for OpenHab, and if you hit openhab.org, they're all listed there. Um, an astonishing number of things can can be uh, connected in here, um, and that's that's the that's the upside of open source. So. Insteon, these guys uh, sort of picked up where the uh, X10 folks left off and have really kind of um, made the prosumer kind of um, light switches, plug modules, all of that sort of thing. If you can't afford or don't want to go to Lutron or those types of brands, this is your option. It's still 60 goddamn dollars for a light switch. <laughs> so be it. <clears throat> and then we have Hue. Um, everyone knows Philips Hue bulbs. Those are, of course, the color-changing LED bulbs. They have a pretty good color gamut, fun to play with, pretty neat. If anyone's ever played Artemis, anybody? The Starship Simulator bridge game thinger? It's only in Windows. We played in May. It was awesome. Um, <clears throat> but that game actually has a whole bunch of stuff shoved into it so that you can have red alert, turn all of your lights red. and Yes! You do that for sure. If you and watch Sharknado, you will do a uh, thing to respond to And of course, the Rob Ford cameo. Yeah. <laughs> um, the one thing I did want to talk about with you is it's this, this convenient hub right here. Uh, says it's Zigbee. It's kind of Zigbee. Do not buy this and think you're getting a full-featured Zigbee hub if you have a lot of other Zigbee devices because you will be super angry. <laughs> very sad, so get a real one. If you get a real one, it will control your Hue stuff, and just of course, the, the reverse is not necessarily true. Um, the folks at Philips saw fit to implement most of the protocol. Um, so, basic architecture, you have um, in the system events, obviously, so switches on and off, intended as commands or as a status update. Um, these bindings, which this is like a list of the ones I'm using, uh, so it is extremely uh, abridged. As I said, there's a lot more. So all of these are intended to, uh, basically the binding will fire events off. Um, items, these are things a binding helps you control. Um, light switches, scalar devices like a dimmer switch, um, other really anything that can be zero to 100%, the amount of charge in your, I don't know, in your Tesla, say. I don't know. Um, do they have um, tiger pits? Do they have tiger pits? Tiger picks. Pits. We open pits. a trap door. Oh. To, uh, <laughs> okay, well, I, that's, probably a sw that's probably a switch. It's kind of a binary. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Jonathan okay. really, really doesn't like door to door sales. <laughs> Got it. Okay. See? How full the pit is would be a scout. <laughs> yeah. The tigers are kind of wasted now, so I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> you need a sump pump. Yeah. To get all of that human carnage out of there. Um, and then what they call the site map, and I don't really get why they call it a site map. It's just a uh, a file that sits in in the file system, defines what elements will show up in the GUI, so that you can customize that. Um, again, because it's cell phone and Pebble, you might, you know, want to go about doing that. Um, interestingly enough, also while kind of digging in for this, I discovered that they support Slack, but they don't support HipChat. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Switch to Slack. <clears throat> uh, there we go. It dies for a lot. 
So rather than live code, because that's always embarrassing, uh, these are some snippets <laughs> from, my, uh, from my actual setup. Um, in this case, the astro binding, which is um, actually just astrological data. Um, you tell it where you are, how often you want to know new things, and it calculates it on that basis. So every five minutes, my computer figures out new times for the sunrise and the sunset. If you care where Mars is, it will definitely tell you that. So if you're, you know, fencing <coughs> for a job with Elon and his boys, it's cool. You can know all of that stuff. Um, the binding is basically where you would put your authorization data for the API that you're trying to access. So for example, I have uh, an Ecobee thermostat, but Nest and all of those would of course be the same thing. Shove your, new, your username and password up in there, and then it's all just um, exposed so you can create items from it. Then you create an item. In this case, um, I have both a date time and a switch for the Tiger Pit, which will open uh, at either the beginning of sunrise or the end of sunset. And um, it's kind of digging way in, but if, you know, there's of course different types of sunset depending on what sort of human being you are, whether you are civil or nautical or whatever. So um, the real end of, uh, the real end of sunset is, or the, or the real beginning of sunrise is where I wanna say, turn off everything that's outside. Um, very dead simple example, outside lights turn off at sunrise. Can they control like that? Say again? If the AC is on, close the window. Yes, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you, um, and it, it definitely works that way. Um, I can, I'll get all the updates if, but this is an awesome one. I actually will get a pushover when the wife moves the AC setting. Down. Yeah. <laughs> and then I can just go into my convenient app and read that. Yeah. Um, doesn't make me super popular, I was say, but it's. <laughs> tell you how warm or cold it is on the couch. <laughs> yeah. Hey, wait, wait. And no reason, you, no reason you couldn't put in a remote sensor for the couch. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there is actually, there's a, there's a binding for Plex, so you can absolutely have the lights turn off when you start a movie, like, you know, whatever. Again, century of laziness. Um, <laughs> so this is kind of their breakout of the, the um, I don't know, I, I wanna say the OSGI uh, framework because the, the, um, the graphs are astonishingly similar. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything is really kind of just based on this event bus and everything happens in there. Uh, one awesome pitfall that I have found with this system is if you set a timer and don't clear it, it sucks up memory and eventually your server crashes. Dan can absolutely attest to that because I come in at least one, one day a week and be like, Argh! my stupid open hab crashed and then my lights didn't turn on when I opened the front door and I'm super mad. Um, so, it is a ongoing development project, absolutely. Uh, 1.7, I think, is where we started. 1.8, they're up to now, and that's their kind of um, semi-beta release, almost. Uh, 2.0 is, I think, on release 3 right now. They're kind of, it's almost there. Um, I started reading docs for it last night to see if I should base this entire presentation on 2.0 and the answer was absolutely not. There's a lot of parenthesized things that says finish this doc, finish this doc, so on. So, um, you know, probably give them about six months and that'll be into release, which is awesome because it does contain a way to actually configure your setup with a GUI. Currently, it's a lot of VI, so if you are um, not a computer programmer, which obviously doesn't really apply to anyone in this room, but it's not um, extraordinarily ready for, um, you know, normal consumer use. If, if you want to do home automation in a way that's going to be user friendly, buy any of the gazillion appliances out in the world and fight with their UI. Um, the nice thing with this is if it's broken, you can fix it. Ish, <laughs> maybe not, I don't know. 
and really, that's uh, my whole presentation. Uh, yes. You mentioned that something happens and it crashes. Um, you mentioned it just a couple of minutes ago. Uh, what is that? When, you, when it, uh, it keeps running. It keeps running. So. Um, to kind of put it, I guess, in perspective against um, some other home automation technologies that are out there, uh, there's one called Mr. House. It's based on Perl, and everything in that um, in that uh, environment runs on a loop, and it just kind of goes through and looks to see if any events have hit the bus. And um, it was more awful for this. Um, this is. I don't even know the root cause. Um, it was a question of just going through logs and seeing like, oh, okay. So I was setting a whole pile of timers basically based on a, on a switch event, um, saying like, okay, if I turn on the exhaust fan in the bathroom, set a timer for 20 minutes to turn it off, except that every time it turned on, it was setting a new timer without clearing the old one, and that took up sufficient memory to eventually just explode, which is astonishing given, the, you know, the size that the application's <laughs> allowed to grow to before anything bad happens. Um, I also have um, sensors on front and back door, same kind of idea. It's triggering an event and then setting a timer that it doesn't clear and whatever. So there were, if I go out of this, because this is just silly. Uh, let's see here. If I, uh, oh, you can't see that. Hmm. Oh, that's amazing. Command shift plus. Well, it, it's over here, and it got really small. And then it popped back over here. See, this is why live coding is embarrassing. <laughs> Should have used that. <laughs> Pull aside, but Ecobee. And it'd be live configuring it. It's going to work. Yeah. I was going to say, Ecobee yeah, is the uh, thermostat company, is uh, Toronto based, and looking for job of people to do my guess stuff. So. Yep. In fact, uh, the reason I have an Ecobee thermostat is because my wife used to work there. Um, so, what am I trying to do here? Oh, I see. Everything exploded. And I don't have internet anymore. It's just evaporated. Switch to mirror and it'll make you happier. I, d I was on that, that one. That one's listed as 50 hertz, which you could actually hear if it was working. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, to answer your question, I suppose the straight answer is I don't really know. Um, it ended up being having to null out the, the, the timer object and then, um, and then set a new value into it on, on every occurrence of trying to use it. Don't as soon as you're done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, How many home automation protocols are there? Quite a few. <coughs> well, yeah, there's so, yeah, I mean, Lutron, Insteon, off the top of my head. Um, Lots of Tron, there's Crestron. There's Crest, yeah, Crestron, who are sort of, well, kind of an integrator. Um, the, the thing, well, here, let's just. <coughs> of course, I'm going to need the internet. There, hey, it's back. All right. <laughs> I don't like fun games. Okay, I'm about done with not having mirror mode. Jonathan's right.
Yeah. <coughs> the best part about this is show mirroring options in the menu bar isn't showing menu option mirroring options in the menu bar. Should be under the arrangement. The arrangement thing has a. Yes. This is so the best thing ever. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Again, enthusiast. Um, <laughs> so this is um, just the dumb UI, but you can dig in and see, um, you know, like these weather atmospheric facts are all kind of updated hourly. And you can make decisions on that if you happen to have something to control your lawn sprinklers or something, which I don't. You but sense weather. <laughs> you sense it. Look, there's 75% clouds. Is Do that, something. Is that like a cloud? <laughs> <laughs> is that an internet sense? Or is that a physical sense? Is that like no matter what, it's so this is kind of fun, you know, like <laughs> they do have a, this convenient color picker for your hue bulbs if you have hue bulbs. Uh, well, this is sort of fun. I love that this keeps refreshing. But I can turn off the TV. There's all kinds of, you know, great stuff. And of course, uh, no, no. <coughs> Thank God. Um, but if we fire into their documentation. Um, oh, one thing I didn't touch on is persistence in here because um, it sort of will scan your bus, whatever your bus happens to be. So there's the Insteon bus, it'll scan anything that's bound to the system at startup and try to figure out what state it's in. But you can use a gazillion different database technologies to persist across restarts, um, which is handy. And it'll make you nice graphs. So if you, you know, care how many lights are on and for how long or what have you. Yeah, if you have a couple dozen lights, like it's like four or five minutes to scan you know, or how many, months, how many nights out of the months you're sleeping on the couch. How many nights out of the month? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The asterisk binding, if you, you know, I don't know, it can react to you getting a phone call, um, you know, in much the same way, I guess, turn the lights back on because you just push play on your Plex and then you don't want to die while you're going to answer your telephone. Although why you'd have to get off the couch to answer a phone in the year 2016, I don't know. Um, it will do Bluetooth, um, Bluetooth detection, which would be kind of cool if Bluetooth was always on on something on your person and you had a whole bunch of Bluetooth devices around, you know, the house or apartment. Um, interestingly enough, they don't have um, uh, iBeacon stuff in their app at all on iOS, nor do they have anything in any of the other technologies, which I think is kind of crazy. If you're going to go to the trouble of having an app, It would just be, it, in fact, I have it uh, set up the same thing just for TCP. So if I get on my Wi-Fi network at home, um, I just have my uh, phone with a DHCP reservation. So as soon as this IP comes up, it knows I'm there. It just takes anywhere between zero and 20 minutes, unless I take my, unless I take my phone off my hip, right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it for unlocking your door, but it's, you know, it's good for presence detection and that kind of stuff. So you start to make some decisions like, you know, for example, I have my, my front door lights like the in the foyer will come on when I open the door, but that doesn't need to happen during the day and it doesn't need to happen if I'm uh, not home, I guess. But, or you can have all the lights turn off when you know no one's there. This is, this is sort of the idea. So I have three things that contribute to presence in my house, which is my phone, Heather's phone, and whether or not my TV is turned on. So it's a pretty pretty good bet. Can you do geofencing stuff like tell your Ecobee not to have the AC on when you're more than a kilometer from your house? Uh, I don't know. 
because, well, I, I actually can answer that with a no in the sense that the app will not do any GPS reporting. Um, you'd have to do <coughs> something third party. Okay. And, it, and it, you know, so. A bit, it's been a question on my mind because we have a nested. Uh, yep. We wish it would turn on our AC when we're getting close to it, but it doesn't. <laughs> right. It turns on the AC when we come inside and like wave at it. Right. Hi, Nest. Like, here hi, I am. It's really hot in here. Could you like fix the that? smoke pour out of it at all? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that hasn't been an issue. But could you set it to do like um, random lights and this kind of thing if you're going away on holiday? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, more than me, Dan's got a lot of that stuff set up with his setup. With your, you have he implemented a switch called vacation mode, and then uh, has structured the rules to say. Um, you know, don't do anything if I'm not home. Don't turn on the espresso machine, don't turn on the espresso machine in the morning, but at 8 o'clock at night, turn some lights on so, yeah, it looks like I'm yeah, home. So just, yeah. yeah. And so, again, you're going you're gonna to tie in, um, you know, the astrological data <laughs> with whether or not someone is home, and you can start to do, you know, fun stuff like that. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> There's a generic RS-232 binding, so if you need to send a command to like a done thing, done. So um, like if you wanted to make blinds go up and down, what would you do? There is a, there is one. Sure, it's tough. Let's see, if I just There's like control F for blinds or drape or uh, curtain. <laughs> There's definitely stuff. Uh, you can turn on your music. <coughs> anyway, it gives you a, a pretty good idea. Um, what's really kind of aggravating, also kind of as a little side note, my TV doesn't go on line if it's off. So I kind of have to have two magical bindings. <coughs> One's just a TCP binding that says, oh, hey, cool, the TV is up, I can ping it. And then secondarily, then you have access to all of the controls for the TV through their API, which means I can make controls in the OpenHab world, um, which, whatever. I could care less about turning the volume up and down and changing channels, but it's more of a detection thing. And really for that, just go to Plex and, you know, the only thing that doesn't cover is Netflix. <laughs> so really, I think the, the, the gist of it is there's so much stuff being written. This, this list has gotten longer even since I've you know, started using OpenHab. Um, people just you know, buy a product and write a, write a binding for it. And then it's up to you to make glue. Um, you know, DMX. Who has DMX at home? I do, but that's a, that was a, I was, no. DMX is a, DMX, oh yeah. DMX is a lighting data <coughs> protocol thing. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, you can use it with your Starship bridge simulator game to make even more red light happen, so it's extremely pivotal. Um, yeah. The BenQ projector binding. Why not? Cops binding. I guess they're printed. They're. That'd be cool if you had Print every time you're. That is what your alarm is. Yeah. Yeah, your alarm in the morning just fires up your teletype. Yeah. Off you go. Like that. Yeah. It's not as fun with laser. So that is that's it for me. Let's, let's drink beer and have some fun. You're so not fired. <laughs>